Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, City Club President, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on Friday, June 18th for this week's Friday Forum. Today we will hear from Judges Ann Aiken and Michael Marcus about how thoughtful sentencing practices can reduce crime and transform offenders. But first, some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask everyone in the room who has not already done so to please silence your cell phones. If there are any members who, here who have joined the club recently or who are with us here at a Friday Forum for the first time, please stand and let us welcome you. As always, we offer our appreciation to those whose generous financial backing makes our time-honored City Club luncheons possible. Please join me in offering a appreciative round of applause to the Don Sterling City Club Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. We greatly appreciate your support. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club offices. In addition to Friday forums, City Club hosts many other events throughout the year, such as our Citizen Salon series. This dinner and discussion series brings together good food and great conversation, while at the same time supporting the vital mission of City Club. We invite you to join us for upcoming salons which will explore the future of the Republican Party, building community, and Portland's virtual museum of cities. At next week's Friday Forum, Governor Ted Kulingoski will release recommendations for restructuring state government to overcome a decade of deficits. We're expecting a full house, so please visit the club website or call the club offices soon to reserve your spot. And now to today's program. For the past quarter century, the dominant theory in criminal justice has maintained that imposing lengthy incarceration determined by standardized criteria is the best way to reduce crime. But a growing body of evidence suggests that flexible sentences, sentencing practices based on a careful examination of the facts of each case can reduce crime, help ex-offenders become valuable members of society, and save taxpayers money. Today's speakers will explain how we can have, in the phrase of criminologist Mark Kleiman, less crime and less punishment. Today's first speaker is Multnomah County Circuit Court Judge Michael Marcus. A trial judge in Multnomah County since 1990, he handles both civil and criminal cases. He has promoted legislation, technological applications, and procedural improvements designed to make crime reduction a major ingredient of sentencing decisions. He has published articles concerning the role of sentencing and crime reduction in many legal journals, and he promotes technology in service of public safety and children and families in crisis as a member of the Oregon E-Court Steering and Implementation Committees. He is Multnomah County Circuit Court's most senior judge. Our second speaker today is Federal District Court Chief Judge Ann Eichen. A native Oregonian, she received her law degree from the University of Oregon. She worked in private legal practice for a number of years and later served as the chief clerk of the Oregon House of Representatives. She then returned to private practice and remained there until she became a district judge and later an Oregon Circuit Court judge. President Bill Clinton nominated her to a seat on the U.S. District Court for the District of Oregon in 1997. On February 1, 2009, she became chief judge, the first woman to hold that position on the Oregon Court. And without further ado, please help me welcome today's first speaker, Judge Michael Marcus. Thank you. Uh, I think the most important thing for me to convey to you is not how great things are going, but how horrible the status quo is from which we are finally emerging. 
the notion that crime and punishment has anything responsibly to do with crime reduction is woefully misplaced. Mainstream sentencing, by which I mean the sentencing that occurs in the great bulk of cases, 90% of the cases in which sentences are imposed, have nothing responsibly to do with reducing crime, public safety, or evidence-based decisions. The wonderful things that are going on in criminal justice have to do with collaboration with the probation departments, with uh, evidence-based practices among partners that are either private or public producers of various kinds of treatment programs, um, the treatment courts, the specialty courts that have transformed the role of judge from st stern administer of sanctions to an involved human being who can play a powerful role in getting the attention of the offender to what changes are needed and to the value of success by meeting out sanctions, both positive and negative, as appropriate to achieve success. The fact is that these treatment courts, these specialty courts, are generally doing a far better job when measured than standard punishment for the same crimes for the same people. But they only reach the lowest level of offenders because politically there's still this division between those who like punishment and those who do not. Most sentences are the result of plea bargains between the prosecutor and the defense attorney. The defense attorney does not have public safety high on the list unless the defense attorney has a very unusual client. The prosecutor could be thought to have public safety high on the list, and some of them will tell you that they do. In the same way that any other faith-based system assumes that what they're after is most consistent with public safety, but it has nothing to do with anything like evidence-based researched data to support that conclusion. The result is that most of the sentences by far, over 90% of them, represent no responsible effort whatsoever to achieve that result, which is most likely to prevent future criminal behavior, even though our laws are full of directions that that's our job. In short, most sentencing, mainstream sentencing, ignores our constitutional and statutory obligation to reduce crime, and we tell our participants, judges and DAs, that if the sentence you got was within the legal limits, complies with the guidelines, you have accomplished all you are necessarily obligated to accomplish. You'll notice that that list does not include crime reduction. Therefore, it doesn't. And I can assure you that although it's certainly true that none of us has the ability to take any offender and prevent any crime in the future by that offender, by not paying attention responsibly to what's most likely to work, we are ultimately generating down the road murders, rapes, assaults, and horrible crimes for which we can avoid any accountability for. We certainly don't want to go around looking for ways to connect them to us, and therefore we tend to resist any rigorous and meaningful performance measurement, which is, after all, somehow clothed, critical to determining what works best and what doesn't. 60% of the defendants sentenced for most crimes recidivate, commit new crimes. Um, plea bargaining addresses 90 to 95% of sentences. Um, if you go around assessing the people who are in jail or prison, you'll find that 60 to 70% of them have been in jail or prison before. 
We've allowed just desserts to be a free pass from accountability on the part of prosecutors and judges for best efforts at crime reduction. If you've done just desserts, meaning you do what the guidelines say you should do under the circumstances or under the grid block you've agreed to, you've done all you need to do. There's a lot of hope, basis for hope, for change, for improvement. We have lots of good text in the laws that we passed over the years, after the, under the last two decades, that crime reduction is the purpose. Uh, collaboration with all those people who have been recognizing evidence-based practices around the courts, pretrial release, probation, post-prison supervision, prison curricula, designers, they have wonderful connection with the best developing science and they use it the best they can. The problem is our misallocation of correctional resources by stupid sentencing, which after all is the opposite of, of smart sentencing, is that we make the tools unavailable to do the best we can with them to serve public safety. We have other good signs of improvement coming our way. The Criminal Justice Commission has created a risk assessment instrument which will soon be available to all judges and attorneys, which will give a very realistic picture of where the, an offender rep exists on a scale of dangerous to extremely dangerous as compared with all the other offenders in his or her category. Uh, we have pretrial invest investigations now that look at what programs might work, might not work, look at risk assessments, needs assessments, and what programs might be available in and out of custody. Uh, judicial education is increasingly attending to evidence-based sentencing. We have worked on recently some efforts for controlling plea bargaining by saying, for this kind of crime, this is the kind of disposition we're going to start with unless you can argue persuasively based on evidence that counts that something else will work better. Um, we have sentencing support tools in Multnomah County and we are working towards building analytical tools as part of the court technology project known as eCourt so that judges will have at their hands those devices which will help us make the best possible decision within the legal constraints to get the best result. Treatment courts in general are the best thing we've got going for changing the behavior of the bulk of offenders who most frequently repeat crime. These are people who are into property crime and drug related. The problem again, as I mentioned, is that we've been forced towards the less serious crimes. The wonderful advantage that the reentry courts add and the 60-day limitation on revocation has done a pretty similar thing. And that 60-day revocation limit says you can't put somebody in prison for more than 60 days if they violate probation, regardless of how much time is out there. All of a sudden, you have people who used to be on opposite sides coming to court with the best workable solution of which project, which conditions, which third party can help this defend and overcome the problems which are leading to criminal behavior. Well, we also get to the higher risk people through the reentry courts, and Judge Aiken will tell you about them. First of all, it is truly my privilege to be um, with my colleague, Michael Marcus. And what I want to take a minute and do is pay tribute to his work um, and the breadth of his knowledge of evidence-based practices and his understanding of the criminal justice system that wasn't even the tip of the iceberg. And he has strong, strong feelings about it. And what I can tell you as the Chief Judge of the District of Oregon and someone involved in this over the last 13 years and 22 years of my career on the bench is as I go across the country and my colleagues, I could talk about uh, Judge Gertner in Boston who teaches at Yale, come to me and say, do you know Michael Marcus? Uh, Michael Marcus it writes uh, uh, articles that are used as the basis of this discussion point. And his feelings are strong because 
he has done research and it's very hard in a very short moment to talk about what we know about what works. But I want to tell you that really what, what we're about as judges and we share many of the same uh, views of evidence-based practices is I spend my days repairing adults and I spend my free time growing children. By growing children that's working in early intervention programs for children of abuse and neglect and I've done that my entire career. I continue to do that. I will do that till the day I die because that's where we have to work and there's a nexus between children and families and the correctional system. But I spend my day repairing adults. I'm very happy to hear uh, Judge Marcus talk about the use of the risk assessment tool because that risk assessment tool has now been um, used in the federal system and it is guiding us. So I want to talk a little differently about um, what I call sentencing, hope and accountability. We spend our day holding people accountable for their behavior and then we have an obligation as a system to give people hope about their ability to make a difference. Now what you need to know is 650,000 people come out of prison every year. And in Oregon, what was happening when we started looking at this more intensely is we were having individuals coming out on federal probation to Oregon and turning around and within three dirty UAs back in a federal bed. And it was costing us a fortune and still costs us an enormous amount because essentially two thirds, three quarters of the people in prisons if not greater, have drug and alcohol addiction issues. And methamphetamine was destroying the fabric of this state and continues to be a scourge on what we're trying to accomplish both in the public and private sectors. So we had a summit. We brought all the national leaders out at the Federal Bureau of Prisons and we had a big discussion about what works. Because at that time, the way the U.S. Attorney's um, Office practiced because we had sentencing guidelines, the um, charging decisions made by, I would point out, our U.S. Attorney um, here today is um, Dwight Holden. He's here. He's a participant. There, we're, we're all together in how we look at this. Uh, Eric Suing, our Chief of Probation, is here. And I would tell you, we are looking at this from our respective vantage points in how we approach the following problem. Evidence-based practices means you actually have to use evidence. And what was happening years ago um, was when you sentenced somebody, the guidelines made the decisions. But what changed at that summit is that when people come out of prison, the court, the judges, have the statutory obligation to manage their behavior in what we call supervised release. And therein was the opportunity, the door opening to look at what we needed to do differently because very frankly, I don't know about how you are, but I do not like failure. I don't like seeing people who I need to serve fail and I don't certainly want them back in the communities re-victimizing. So we took a look at evidence-based practices and in fact I think Eric Suing would uh, concur that in the federal system we did not use evidence-based practices to decide who was given a contract. We awarded contracts for services on who could deliver the services in the cheapest fashion. So we were getting what we paid for and that wasn't very much. So when we took a look at what evidence-based practices, a lot of the writings of co my colleagues and criminologists and researchers and medical providers in the mental health community, we took a look at what we could do differently and we started re-entry courts. We called them drug courts initially because our offenders had a, an, an understanding about how that might work. So we have changed in the context of just this short period of time. They've been up and running on the federal side in Oregon for five years. Um, right now, it's our fifth anniversary at the moment. And we put together the best practices, we put to together a model, and we put it together as a team. So our team consists of the judge, the probation officer, who's assigned to reentry, the prosecutor assigned to reentry, the assistant U.S. attorney, the defense attorney, and then auxiliary services, including treatment providers, um, education providers, housing, child services, little teeny kid services, um, anything people might need. And we, uh, because it's evidence-based, we set up a model, we staff the model, and we have a comparison group. And we have been running the data, which of course in the past wasn't kept and now is kept. We were running the data and we produced, and I'm going to show it, we not only set up our model, but we wrote why we set it up. We wrote the four bodies of literature that Melissa Alvin, a PhD and law clerk now working as a Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court fellow, 
reviewed. We used two researchers at the University of Oregon and we did data analysis that we had to go back and create by hand. We analyzed the data, we wrote about it, we put the bibliography together, we told the anecdotal and case studies, and we published and graded our own work. That was unheard of in our system. But because we did this, and because we've captured both in terms of data and the information about our people, we've gone from Oregon starting really the first reentry court to more than half the districts in the federal system across the country have reentry programs. And I'm here to sort of preemptively let you know that the Bureau of Prisons now identifies a reentry specialist either by region or by prison. I suspect we might get asked back here when the Attorney General releases his report and his recommendations that were started by his reentry subcommittee chaired at one point by now Circuit Court Judge Karen Imbergut who asked to have assistant then acting U.S. Attorney Kent Robinson chair with Spencer Overton and the breadth of their recommendations are substantial and I won't steal the thunder of what's about to come down. But I can tell you we are moving with Second Chance Act dollars and we are moving forward with an, a, an agenda that when people come out of prison we're going to take that laser moment and make a difference in their lives. So let me tell you a couple stories. We use that um, risk assessment tool in a profound way. and the, I, have, I run the program in Eugene. I travel the state, so I'm going to tell you, Portland's not the only place with difficulties. And we have to look at the entire state because methamphetamine comes in everywhere and is damaging and ruining this state. Medford's a, a nightmare with issues down there. They're more complex and some of the most dangerous cases. So we work across the state to provide adequate resources. But yesterday, when I had nine people from the District of Nevada, because they come to Oregon to see what we're doing, and three people from the Department of Corrections, the Bureau of Prisons in the federal system come, and because we're working collaboratively, it's all about collaboration. It's all about building partnerships. It's all about leveraging resources. They're the same people, federally or state. They cross over. So let's be smart about dollars. So when they were there yesterday, I told them we, the 10 people, we run a model, the 10 people they were going to see in our reentry program following the graduation of two members. To graduate from our reentry program, you have to be clean and sober for a year. You have to comply with all the terms and conditions. You have to have a job or be going to school. You have to be law abiding and you have to be finding success. If you come in voluntarily and the team accepts you into that program, then at the end of the year, um, we by statute have the ability to give them a year off their supervised release. They earn it. We can do that. For on the motion of any um, counsel or joint recommendation on the prosecutor's behalf and the defense attorneys. But that's the incentive that gets people in. Once they're in, they get a life. So in our reentry court, most of the people, because I'm a believer in, let's take the hardest of the hard, they have criminal history, RPI scores, risk assessment scores, seven, eight, and nine. Nine is the highest. We graduated and we have in our reentry court three armed career criminals right now. And what I'm going to tell you is unbelievable. They're law abiding. They're going to school. Their lives have changed dramatically. And they're here giving back. They contribute by doing community service work because we sit around the table every single month. They come in. We are addressing their needs. We are asking them what they need to be successful. And we are getting those services. And once they've learned that we're there not to trip them up and not to send them back to prison, but to open up and talk about what they really need, we are solving problems that what would, what would happen normally is they would have a problem, they would use an intoxicating substance, criminal, uh, some criminal behavior to drown out the pain. So the person I want to tell you about is 60, 62 years old, 37 years in prison. He's in my reentry court, and he used. And I made him write the following, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we see. I asked him to write why he used. Coming to the end of my life, I have tried many ways to stop, but nothing has worked. If I put myself into the NA program, Narcotics Anonymous, I have to keep the faith it will work for me also. Being addicted at a very young age, Addiction is all I've ever known. Sugar at three, adrenaline at five, 
the excitement of sex at seven, stealing and smoking at eight. By around 10, all of these were who I was, and I started to realize it was wrong. I think the guilt and shame started to build, but it was who I was. By using my addictions to distract my mind from the guilt, I could guard myself from my shame. After reaching puberty, I started to find new addictions, and after starting incarceration, I found ways to be looked up to through sports and rebellion against authority. In my 20s, I added experimenting with drugs to my life, and I found the one that took the pain away and wrapped it in a cocoon of cotton. Two and a half years ago, I found a way to put heroin behind me, but still the pain of exposing my feelings has kept me self-medicating. How to break this cycle is to deal honestly with my feelings. How to deal honestly with my feelings is what I am looking for. Will I find it before my addictions kill me? I pray I get the chance. We have story after story after story of the people coming out that make this just one of many. It's shocking to hear, but you should hear the stories. And he talks about being tied to a tree at five because he wasn't a learner in school. They're all, all these issues are tied back to doing a better job with children and families and dealing with the hardest of the hard in the abuse and neglect arena. But it's also working the other end of the people who are costing this state of fortune. And our data tells us the following. Two-thirds of the federal people on probation across the country will probably successfully move through what I would refer to because we don't have adequate services nor enough probation officers to do the best job, what I call a catch and release and catch system. We catch them, we hold them, we release them, then we catch them again. What we're doing is stopping that because what we're doing is identifying the hardest of the hard. We're bringing them together. The judge is on top of those cases once a month, if not more often. So if they start to slide, we are yanking them and bringing them back into court, which will stop revictimization and we will address their needs. And we found instead of taking away support, we are upping support because their behavior is a symptom. And that's what evidence-based practice is about, is identifying what's causing the behavior that is doing damage in the community and victimizing again and again and again. So what we have is a model that when we looked at our data, and I brought it, and I have, I could tell you most everything about everyone who's been through the program in Eugene, and then we have Judge Redden uh, manages the reentry court in Portland, and I can tell you that of our data, of the third of the remaining people who are out coming and going back and forth and back and forth and costing a fortune, because the most expensive bed is a federal prison bed, we, in the reentry court, we are succeeding with 55% result, with the hardest of the hard. These are folks who are criminal crime spree people. They just rack and ruin communities. So the nice thing about this is when we graduated two of them last, last night, one of them, uh, it took him failing twice at the 11th month self-destructive behavior because he was so badly abused, he's never had any success in his life. It took me the third try through to stay with him to break, break through. And he wrote in the report, you would read it, he didn't know if he'd ever been loved or ever would love. When he graduated yesterday, he's fully employed, he's in school, I will eventually write a letter of recommendation for his completion of a degree in creative writing at the University of Oregon, because I know it's on his list of things to do. But he's, for the first time, in love and has um, a partner and they're expecting a baby, so he's gonna do it right and he's gonna do it carefully. He graduated and every person, including the, the assistant U.S. attorney, got up and said we never thought it was possible. And he talked about what I will tell you, the judges have not been able to use of late. The most powerful, powerful thing a judge has is good power. People want to do better for adults and they want to do better for the way in which they are seen. Shame and guilt is unbelievable. Giving back is unbelievable for them because they think they're not worthy of anything. So when they have to come back and talk to us about what they do well and where they're succeeding 
it is a very powerful incentive. So in the federal system, we've had only sticks and weapons. Now we're moving because evidence-based practices talk about incentives, carrots, problem solving, deficits, and solutions. So it isn't a mystery that we've been able to go to the Oregon legislature and find friends to the Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court who's here today, Paul DeMunis, and find people who want to collaborate. To work with Mercy Corps sitting here working with Roar in Portland to collaborate on a very unique state federal reentry model. In, we have three models, Portland, Eugene, and Southern Oregon to collaborate and leverage our resources. Crime and children and families belong to all of us. And unless we do something different, we are leaving the next generation a, a deficit and a problem that goes way beyond what they can even imagine. Because a question is going to get asked. You know, the Oregonian isn't a statewide newspaper anymore. I don't get it, in Eugene, but somebody handed me an, an article that was there. But I, I want to tell you something. When Measure 11 passed, it was driven by 1,800 violent juvenile offenders. That's what the, the, the pressure and the damage and the it, people were so angry. And those of us in the dependency cases and those of us who sat on the bench and did kids and families, back then there were 20,000 children under the jurisdiction of the courts in dependency cases in the state of Oregon. I'm here to tell you of those 1,800 violent juvenile offenders, I'm willing to bet, we don't have the data because nobody kept it, I'm willing to bet that 95% of those had been in foster care or abuse and neglect situations. I'm willing to bet everything on it. So they drove a very expensive discussion about how Oregon would make decisions. And that discussion um, resulted in the statutes that all of us have dealt with as a state court judge and uh, watched as a taxpayer. But at the same time, those of us who saw what was coming said, you have 20,000 children and families in dependency cases. If only half of them become violent juvenile offenders, we will never stop building prisons and juvenile facilities. Can't we please use evidence-based practices and look more thoughtfully at how we address the most complicated problem on the planet? the human being. Could we please take a look at doing a better job? I pay tribute to Michael Marcus for taking the time to academically write and tell about what we need to do. He has been a leader that has been sung across this country. And I pay tribute to him, and it's an honor to be a colleague with someone who has courage to say what isn't working and what we can do better, because as Oregonians, don't we really want the best? Thank you. The first question for our speakers, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host. Our host today is Ted Kay. Ted is Vice President for Finance at DVS Analytics, a technology company serving the contact center marketplace. A City Club member since 1990, Ted received the City Club President's Award in 2008 and 2009. Ted? Thank you, Sharon. This is a question for Judge Marcus, but I'll invite Judge Aiken to add her, uh, add her thoughts. Yes, in today's Oregonian, there's an op-ed piece by Tara Lawrence, who is the executive director of the Oregon Anti-Crime Alliance. And she asserts, Measure 11 provides truth in sentencing, actually saves lives and protects Oregonians from the most violent of criminals and sex offenders, helps prevent future victimization, and achieves its stated goal at a cost considerably less than the predicted cost. So my question is, is she asking the right question? Is she posing the question correctly? And is she reaching the right answer to the question? Judge Marcus. Yes and no. <laughs> um, the reason we have ballot measure 11 is because as a system, we have abdicated our responsibility to exercise best efforts to achieve best outcomes, and therefore haven't. 
In comparison with standard mainstream sentencing, ballot measure 11, for all of its faults, is a more logical, rational, and effective result. That's how bad mainstream sentencing is. What we don't know for that $100,000, I, I can't vouch for her figures, it's just assuming those $100,000 crimes prevented by people being locked up under ballot measure 11, we also need to worry about how many crimes occur after imprisonment because of imprisonment that would not have occurred but with a, a smarter result uh, approach to this offender, a better attempt to identify the source of the criminal behavior and address it in a meaningful way. Um, we do not have a comparison between the public cost and the public benefit of evidence-based practices against the same cohort as we have used ballot measure 11 on. Again, I agree that there are some people that evidence-based analysis must tell us remain, must remain incarcerated because we can't fix them. And part of the problem that divides the two camps is that each side wants so badly to believe their side that they're rarely heard to concede that, that for some people the other side is right. Well, I've sentenced some people where I know that indefinite incarceration is the only way to achieve safety from them. Um, let me give you an example of why ballot measure 11 is just too broad a brush just as a matter of justice. Two weeks ago I had a woman who, whose addiction began when she was in an auto accident. She had terrible pain um, and medication for the pain and is very common. She became addicted to the pain medication as her life developed. She became addicted to and user of uh, illegal controlled substances. Uh, she was in treatment programs on her own. She had been free of the use of uh, illegal controlled substance, substances for 18 months. She was using an anti-anxiety um, pill that was prescribed. For some reason, she took 50 of the 60 in the, ball, in the, the bottle. When she came to, she was having what they call a, a reverb, um, which was that she was feeling so depressed that she was seriously considering suicide and it occurred to her through her muddled thinking that the only way to save her life was to get arrested. She went out and committed the minimal robbery one that she could think of. And she was duly convicted over an interesting defense, but duly convicted. And I had no choice but to put her in prison where she will not receive treatment that she needs for 90 months and that is among the people that the editorial referred to and she's surely someone whose life could be put in better shape at far less expense per citizen with far greater likelihood of success and with far less brutality. I would tell you, Speak right in. I would tell you the other uh, a worry that all of us have um, in this discussion is you need to get close to the radio. I'm pulling, I pulled out an article that I carry around because when we deal with reentry, we're dealing many with many dual diagnoses. For the, or for those folks, you need to understand that's a mental health diagnosis coupled with uh, self-medicating through uh, controlled substances, and it's it's rampant. And what I have in front of me is uh, from the Department of Corrections a, a release that with the budget cuts that are expected, um, 6,844 or 49 percent of the current inmates in the 14 Oregon prisons have diagnosed mental health illnesses. And with the anticipated cuts in the um, budgets that are coming, I can't imagine um, what they're going to try to do to address a, a need that is so substantial and as a society should make us all incredibly uneasy that we are incarcerating the mentally ill. I, I want to read to you something that I think is really profound that we have and you can go on our website at the court www.usdistrictcourtoforegon 
um, .gov and go to probation and get a copy of our 150 page um, evaluation and review and take a look at it because I think data uh, is helpful and it's not perfect because people are complicated again. But I want to read you something and I want you to think about it as Oregonians. The mood and temper of the public in regard to the treatment of crime and criminals is one of the most unfailing tests of the civilization of any country. A calm and dispassionate recognition of the rights of the accused against the state and even of convicted criminals against the state. A constant heart searching by all charged with the duty of punishment, a desire and eagerness to rehabilitate in a world of industry all those who have paid their dues in the hard coinage of punishment tireless efforts towards the discovery of curative and regenerating processes in an unfaltering faith that there is a treasure if only you can find it in the heart of every man. These are the symbols which in the treatment of crime and criminal, criminals marks and measures the stored up strength of a nation and are the signs and proof of the living virtue in it. There is a balance of what our obligations are. This was a speech given by Winston Churchill in 1910. I'm going to tell you, when the pendulum swings, we do damage to the concept that what we have is a system of accountability and hope. And the hard coinage of once people have paid their dues, they need to come back out in a thoughtful way, or they are truly not engaged, and they will hurt the communities. So all of this debate really has to come to the middle ground and talk about scarce resources, evidence-based practices, how we, on, this, on the array of services, best address um, the individual needs, what we call individualized tailored services, and at the same time, just as Judge Marcus said, any of us who serve on the bench know there are people who we cannot fix and who need to be incarcerated. But we shouldn't be guessing. We should doing, be doing our best work, and then we should ensure that just because of crowding, we don't make a decisions that may, in, in the long run, um, revictimize and hurt the communities. We will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this question mark card, it means please wrap up with your question. Thank you. Judge Aiken, you mentioned children and families a number of times in, in your remarks. Earlier this week, Meyer Memorial Trust launched a public discussion to uh, invite public input on how they should best invest $1 million to move Oregon from a state of pessimism to a state of prosperity. I'm inclined to think early childhood would be the place to invest that money. Would you share with us your thoughts on, on that? Well, be still my heart. Um, I'm going to tell you, Meyer Memorial has been a tremendous champion and leader in um, the arena of child abuse and prevention, and they I know they know that that's uh, the heart of this solution, and they have been long time, long time supporters of the Relief Nursery Model, which is an early intervention program that addresses comprehensive service delivery to children and families zero to six. And Oregon has 11 nurseries up and running in Oregon, four coming online. And I believe Oregon will be the first state in the country to have an infrastructure for children and families zero to six, a national, uh, just a national model. And we're replicating in Texas. And ironically, we have 10 nurseries up and running and very successful in the Ukraine because we can't adopt out all the children of the world. So I'm going to tell you, they, they know and they're looking for those models. Absolutely. If we can make a difference and get children ready to learn and address those issues and tie our research to the brain research. I mean, one of the privileges of being on the federal bench is I get to work with some of the finest um, academicians and uh, field of scholars. And Dr. Wilson Compton, MD, PhD at the National Institute of Health who does enormous work on the addiction of the brain and how we can better use evidence-based practices. We talk constantly about why can't we get to children earlier. Um, so I, I can't tell you how your question just is exactly where we should spend our time because again, it's so much easier and cost-effective to grow healthy children than to repair 
damaged and broken adults. Um, I, I just saw somebody in the, in the room that I, I'd like to just pay tribute that uh, Scott Taylor's here, nationally renowned as the head of, the, of corrections across the country for uh, local provi county providers. I, I'm gonna, I, if I attempted to talk about what he chairs, I'll be wrong. But he, right in Portland, I mean, we have some of the finest programs in this state. And if we really are smart, um, we will continue to lead, and Meyer Memorial and the um, Oregon Community Foundation are putting their money to children, and I applaud them. Uh, Greg, Greg Kufori for Judge Marcus. Uh, first, what's the impact on these various alternative programs when under uh, smart sentencing they're required to uh, compile data and show that they uh, work? And uh, second of all, uh, before this revolution in evidence-based sentencing in which you've played such a leading role, what were the dominant theories of sentencing and what was the level of scholarship which underlay them? Uh, question one, I would not have providers do their own research. I would have um, governmental agencies taking the data, selecting the data and extracting it and analyzing it because the last thing I need is the kind of assessment that um, programs make of their own device, of their own success, because they always choose the measure that looks best. And they start out with what percentage completed the program and go downhill from there. Um, theories. Uh, the theories of punishment, um, modern punishment came with the uh, Panopticon, which was Jeremy Bentham's um, prison. The first one was built in. Pennsylvania because he couldn't convince anyone else and the, the Quakers liked it a lot and they had this faith-based notion that properly constructed uh, a prison would um, instill penitence in offenders and they became called, they became uh, penitentiaries. That was theory number one. A later theory uh, was the theory of um, the medical model. Um, the medical model was um, essentially that, that if we could only find out what's wrong with people, we could treat them. We started pretending that we'd found out what worked and treating people, and then we made the terrible mistake of actually measuring what was going on. And it turned out that uh, in 1974, uh, one of the uh, researchers published an article called Nothing Works. And this was a great relief to all sorts of people who went scurrying in various directions. Uh, it helped budget people come up with a whole new budget system. Um, and it drove the progressives, uh, who I have an otherwise great affinity for, to the, what became the guidelines movement. And they now um, support, oddly enough, just desserts as a major function of sentencing because they're afraid that if you really look at data, you'll put everybody in prison. And therefore, they prefer faith-based just desserts at the top end and evidence-based at the bottom end. The model penal code, which is under revision sentencing, is under revision. The uh, present discussion draft actually proposes that we discourage the use of risk assessment to put people in prison and encourage its use to put it, put people, keep people from going out of prison. Uh, Virginia came up with a wonderful device for identify those, the small percentage of people who really needed to be locked up longer because their, their chances of recidivism if released were 100%. And nobody still challenges the science. For, for, for a decade, this, the issue about risk assessment was, oh, the science is all junk science. They've given that up because it's been replicated so many ways. Um, if we can't realize that the best use of science and tools, the tools that are the correctional toolbox, it depends upon adherence, rigorous adherence, to evidence-based results. Then we continue to have a dialogue and a, a, an ideological dispute which will 
ironically support just desserts as the fraudulent justification for all punishment, fraudulent in large part because nobody's usually asked the victim if there is one. First, most cases there is no victim. Second, most victims asked for most crimes who show up to court say, what can we do to keep this person from committing new crimes? The loudest advocates for victims haven't actually talked to most of them because the ones who come to court want to solve the problem. About 80% of them, in my experience, for 20 years. Susan Pierce, member, and in interest of full uh, discovery, I'm a member of the City Club of Portland Research Committee looking at mental health practices in Multnomah County. So for Judge Aiken, who um, provides your mental health and addiction treatment? How is that integrated with, um, if it is, with uh, physical health treatment? And who also provides your services in terms of social work and other resources within the community? Well, that's a big question. Um, thank you for asking it. One of the nicest things is that it requires a judge to get involved and understand what services are about and, and to rely on tremendously well-trained um, probation staff to work in conjunction with identified and de identifying an individual tailored service delivery for that person that will make a difference. And I can tell you that we have some by contract and our contracts now we work very closely with trying to deal with the best people who are doing the best work. And then we go outside and we look and get research done for individual needs. I, one of my graduates yesterday, whose father was the chief of police in North Carolina, um, he was, has had one of the biggest grow operations and um, distribution of marijuana that we've seen around. Uh, went to prison for a very long time and came out and then ran for three years and was picked up finally. Went into prison and came out and what changed him uh, was he um, had a three-year-old son and a, and a significant other. And suddenly he realized he needed to do something different. And when he came to the first reentry court, he sat down and he was new. So we went through our review of everyone and I turned and said, do you want to tell us something about yourself? And he looked at everyone and he said, what happened while I was in prison? People actually care. No one's ever cared. I'm in. Can I please volunteer and join? Why I tell you that is he has graduated in one year. He did everything and more. But what the difficulty when you're coming out of prison in a starved economy where you're competing with people who are not labeled felons, you can't find work. So we've uh, identified pro-social activities so that we can help people stay busy and look for networking until we can find them a job and they're contributing. So he was really the chief of the garden that we started adjoining the courthouse in Eugene, 2.2 acres, where we have in three, since March 6th, have a small farm up and running and we're having the reentry crowd work at uh, not only to understand what it means to be part of something, to do pro-social activities with landscape students from the University of Oregon and community members that just would astound you, to build and give the food to the hungry. So you teach them those pro-social activities. But in the course of that, we found out he had a giant hernia that he could not get a job. So we were able to negotiate and help him, help him, not do it for him, help him figure out how to get that resolved. He's a different person now. He's re his issues are behind him. He's made peace with his chief of police dad in North Carolina. He's taking his three-year-old son down to meet the grandparents. He's got a job. He comes and volunteers in the garden, and he serves as peer support for everyone else. And I would tell you that it's just simply understanding and knowing your community, and it's the job a judge needs to undertake to understand how to deliver the best services, because you just have to do your homework. My name is Maria Everhart, and I'm a pretty new City Club member. My question is for Judge Marcus. I see Judge Aiken's stories as sort of evidence-based release, how to help people repair after they're released. What 
inroads, how long of a job do we have ahead of us? How much inroad would you say evidence-based sentencing has made in uh, courts in general outside of the treatment court or the sort of side uh, diversions? Maybe in fractions or something I can understand. <laughs> uh, the, the remarkable thing that's happened in the last year is um, it, at first I didn't understand how this happened. It, I felt that I had died and gone to heaven and things were running. Everybody in the courtroom was acting as if their job was to find a solution for a very troubled defendant whose probation report looked like, okay, we've tried everything, He's, he keeps screwing up, he keeps leaving treatment, he keeps getting new, but, new arrests, uh, he doesn't show up for court when he's ordered to, so let's just put him in prison. Now, the same person is, uh, is attended to by the same DA, same probation officer, uh, perhaps the same defense attorney, and often there's this third person from a provider. And together they have been working for the week before the hearing to come up with the most likely plan to work and with an explanation for why it's going to work. And all that's changed is the prosecutor can no longer get rid of this person for more than 60 days. And the probation officer, who's always been in, uh, saturated in evidence-based practice training, because unlike the courts, they have uh, promoted this for a long period of time, um, they want to work on the solution. That's happened tremendously quickly. Uh, how long will it take for severe or su significant uh, progress, that 60-day business uh, created a substantial leap forward, but the next case involved a, um, a minor new crime as part of the alleged probation violations. It was a minor trespass, and the whole attitude was different. Let's give up on this guy. Uh, let's put him in prison for the 17 months that he can get under the original sentence. Um, we have a long way to go, but the real long way we have to go, really, is at the legislative level to have enough correspondence between the lovers of ballot measure 11 and the lovers of treatment and evidence-based practices to understand that the real question is who's doing a better job of preventing victimizations and reducing public cost. If we can have a rigorous, transparent, and persuasive enough statistical oversight that's viewable to people, if the courts and the legislatures accept the accountability for the data, and the data is put together to reveal and not to conceal, what's really happening as a result of which I believe Given the budget crisis, we can actually make some real progress in the next five or ten years. I want to I want to take one second to give you paint a picture for people to think about in the bigger sense of the world, and it goes back to how I started: growing children, repairing adults. India, the talented and gifted pool of students, and China, the individual talented and gifted pool of students individually equal all of America's children. The more we take away from schools, education, early intervention to fund a debate that's costing all of us a great deal of money without coming to the table and having a discussion, it really will be a debate that will overrun us because other talented and gifted adults will run the global economy. It's that simple. It's a big issue that education has to be about the future. It has to be about our children. And for now, our debate has to be looked at, not only with a green eye shade, but a, with a very broad view of the fact we're not competing with communities in Oregon. We're competing in the world, and we're not putting our resources in a way that will make us active participants in a global economy. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for this week. Please join us on June 25th to hear from Governor Ted Kulongoski about his plans to reset Oregon state government 
And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation for today's guests, Judges Ann Aiken and Michael Marcus. We're adjourned. <laughs>